As Bear said, uh, my name is Mike Downs. I live in Corvallis, Oregon, which is um, where our engineering firm for New Scale Power is. Uh, I have been with New Scale for about three years. Previously, I first started my nuclear career right here in Idaho Falls out in the desert, going to the Naval Reactors facility out there and graduated and went off to sea for a while and got out of the Navy and, and since have been at different power plants uh, doing a variety of startup testing, engineering. I was also a senior reactor operator license at, uh, at Nine Mile Point Nuclear Station which is a boiling water reactor up in upstate New York right on Lake Ontario. I'll go into a little bit about the different type of reactors we have in the United States, commercial reactors that is. I won't even talk about any of the test reactors or any of that stuff because frankly I don't know anything about them. Um, so anyways, new scale power. Our headquarters is in Portland, Oregon. Our major engineering firm is in Corvallis. We have uh, offices in Charlotte, Richland, London, and the DC area for mostly dealing with the regulatory stuff. So, commercial nuclear power plants. Let me ask who has ever, who has worked at all in any kind of energy, power plants, steam turbines, gas, nuclear, anything? So we've got a few folks, oh we got a whole bunch now, okay. So you're somewhat familiar with the whole process of making electricity, right? So basically I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the new scale small modular reactor talk a little bit about what's currently in, uh, in operation here in the United States. I don't know how many has had experience with the current commercial operation. That's all I've been doing all my 40 years, uh, plus years in the nuclear industry. So don't know how to do anything else, but I know how to do that pretty well. So, and then we'll get into new scale and why we're different and why we say we're the safest thing around and why many people, including the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, is agreeing with us. So. Let's move forward from there. So, the global reality, right? You hear a lot about the whole, the carbon issue, right? We, you know, we got too much carbon, we need to get rid of it. We need renewables, we need carbon-free energy. Uh, we need to get rid of coal plants. Let's look at some different stuff here. Dr. Jose Reyes is our chief technology officer. He is also the co-founder of New Scale Power. This was back in 2007. He was then the um, Oregon State University professor of nuclear engineering there. So he was the guy in charge of that department as a PhD in nuclear engineering. And he started up the whole new scale plant and he had a vision that we could go just beyond making electricity. A lot of plants out there make electricity. All right, so what could he do to make things better? And that's carried on into the new scale plant itself, right? So if you look at some of the numbers, we got people are undernourished. We got seven million deaths annually due to the air pollution, right? Directly caused by carbon emissions in there. Water scarcity, it's happening, it's happening now, most, uh, not so much in the United States, but in Africa, you hear it about California with having a lot of drought situations and there's a lot of issues with water there. So we're, as our population keeps on growing in this world, which has gone from about three billion people 50 years ago to seven billion people today, which is a big increase in 50 years. So we're gonna still come run into these problems. So we as a, as a people have to go ahead and try and resolve them. So half the population lacks essential health services. So they're, they're in an energy deficit. So what we're trying to do at New Scale is bring energy basically to the world. We're providing scalable advanced nuclear technology for the production of electricity, heat, and clean water to improve the quality of life for people throughout the world. All right, that is our vision statement mission. So who is New Scale Power? We started in 2007. As I said, Dr. Jose Reyes, sole purpose, complete design and commercializing a small modular reactor. So what is a small modular reactor compared to a large non-modular reactor? It's a good question. So an initial concept started in 2000 with U.S. Department of Energy, AP 600 uh, Westinghouse thing was the multi-application small light water reactor program. We love acronyms, so that's, that's the first one. You'll be tested on that a little bit later. In 2011, Floor Engineering basically bought New Scale Power. New Scale Power is a startup engineering group, right? We don't have any products out yet, right? So there's no cash coming in per se. So Floor 
they're our chief investor. Since Floor has become our investor, we've gotten a lot of DOE funding opportunities for matching funds. We continue to get that, and Bear's going to discuss a little bit of that more later on as far as total DOE commitment. We also, just in the end of uh, July, July 31st, I believe, signed uh, contracts beyond uh, uh, MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding, signed contracts with Doosan Construction Engineering Firm out of South Korea. They're going to fund some, you know, they're bringing some money to the table, basically, for lack of a better term. Uh, they're also going to do some of our engineering work. Sergeant Lundy, a major uh, American engineering construction firm, are also joining New Scale. So we're getting some major players in the industry who have seen our product and we've developed it long enough that they're realizing it's the real thing. All right. So with that being said, Everyone, most everyone knows nuclear power has a bad record of doing stuff on time and under budget. Does anyone not know that? There's always been overruns. You've probably heard about the plants in South Carolina that had to shut down. So New Scale is committed to meeting our, our budgets and our times. And Bear's going to tell you a little bit more about what uh, Utah, or excuse me, UAMPS, is going to monitor us for that before they make any commitments. But that's, he'll talk more about that. So as far as making those commitments, we committed to the NRC that we are going to have a design certification application to them in 2016 at the end, by the end of 2016, and to Floor and everyone else in the nuclear industry. December 31st, December 31st, 2016, at 10 o'clock at night, <laughs> our president signed off on our design certification application, we met our commitment, okay? And that is a key. We have, there's four phases for the NRC to review all our documentation, okay? And then they issue a design certification for our plant, okay? Long time ago, we had committed, like over three years ago, or about three years ago, they had committed to have everything done by September 2020, next year, all right? Right now, our phase one, two, and three are complete, and they are the most comprehensive, phase one especially. It was completed six weeks early. So we are definitely on track to have our design certification issued to us by September 2020, and we do not see anything that's gonna prevent that. Again, that's a big milestone. We consider it very important, because we have to live up to our schedules and our time, so that way we can put something in service, on time, and on budget. It's a big deal. <coughs> All right, uh, move forward. Pressurized water reactor. The new scale SMR is a pressurized water reactor. And so there's tons of, tons of them in the, in the, throughout the world, but I'm just gonna talk about the US industry. They're big. They put out about 1,000 megawatts electric, give or take, 800 to 1,200 or more. All right, they have steam generators, pressurizer, reactor coolant pumps, they put out a lot of power. They put out a lot of electricity. They have a lot of components. They're not exactly simple, all right? They're not modular. So we, being new scale, looked at a way, how can we make this simple? How can we make it easy? How can we make it more safe? And I'll tell you that right here, these reactor coolant pumps, the NRC has mandated that every plan has to be able to withstand and protect the core on a design basis accident. Every nuclear reactor in this country has design basis accidents that they've designed for. Usually the standard one is a double-ended shear of its largest pipe going to the reactor. So in most, but not all, because I don't know all of their designs, but I can tell you in the plant that I was licensed to operate at, we had one of these reactor coolant pumps, and basically we had assumed that a big section of pipe just fell off, guillotine shear. The entire core would empty, all the water would go away, now the reactor's overheating. So we would have to design pumps, valves, AC power, DC power that could pump the water back into the core to keep it safe. It's no different for any commercial reactor in this, in this country. 
they all have to design for their worst case loss of coolant accident. All right? And they all do that using lots of power. AC power, DC power, pumps. I can tell you in my plan I had five emergency core cooling pumps. All big pumps, all pump tons and tons of water. All right, and they ran on AC power, and we had backup diesel generators, emergency diesel generators, that had to be available at all time in order to power them up in case you lost, lost off-site power, okay? There's also a thing in this industry called safety related. All right, basically, safety related, the shortened version is, it's an NRC requirement, it's in the Code of Federal Regulations, and it's a system structure or component that is necessary to shut down a reactor, maintain it shut down and cooled down, and prevent release of radioactivity to the environment. Okay, that's it, that's it in short. Right. The NRC, and therefore us and every other operator in this country, their first priority is number one, is it safe? Can we safe to operate it? Are we gonna melt the core? We don't wanna do that. We can't do that for obvious reasons. Second important thing is can we generate electricity reliably? But number one priority is can we keep the core safe? Can we keep the plant safe? If you can't do that, you can't operate, okay? So currently existing plants in this country, they use a lot of safety related pumps, a lot of safety related, safety -related AC power supply and DC power supply to achieve that function. To show you a little bit of what a new scale reactor is going to look like. So we talked about these big old steam generators, pressurizers, reactor coolant pumps. Steam generators are gone, at least externally. Now they're going to be internally. All the reactor coolant pumps are gone. This is a natural circulation reactor. There is no large bore piping to break. We're going to have reactor core. Reactor pressure vessel, steam generators. Our steam generators are helical type steam generators that are located inside the reactor. Okay. Our pressurizer is a pressurizer space. What a pressurizer does in a, in a PWR reactor, pressurized water reactor, is basically it maintains the pressure there under varying uh, uh, plant conditions, whether it's getting um, shrink or swell caused by heat up, cool down, etc. And they're going to maintain pressure there so you maintain a solid reactor coolant inventory. Okay? That's basically what a pressurizer does. All right? Ours is internal. Conventional plants, whether it's a boiling water reactor or a pressurizer reactor, have this huge containment structures. The containment structure is there in case of an accident. All right? It will contain any of the radiation. TMI had a giant containment structure. All right, it contained all the molten fuel. I mean, they had a fuel melt. There, there's no secrets there. All right, Chernobyl did not have a containment structure. It all went out. They just had a flimsy building, relatively speaking, flimsy. Okay, so every plant in the United States, in order to get a license from the NRC, has to have a containment structure capable of carrying if you get a large break, loss of coolant accident of holding all that energy in. All right, we're no different. Same rules and regulations apply to new scale. Okay, we just do it a little differently. We're not a, we're not a pressurized water reactor that's scaled down. We're totally different in how we do things. We're using natural physics instead of big pumps and valves all the time. So that's kind of what it looks like. There's a containment structure that's surrounding the reactor itself. This is called the reactor module, the entire thing. That containment structure that surrounds the reactor is designed to handle a loss of coolant accident from the reactor itself. So all the inventory goes in there. All right. So how do we cool it? It's a big deal, right? How do we cool it, right? Fukushima, I know everyone here has probably heard about that. What happened to them? They were fine until the tsunami came and then things went very bad very quickly. Right, reactors had all shut down, their generators were running, they're providing power, cooling the cores, everything's happy, tsunami comes, takes away all the, all the diesel generators, just floats them away, flooded them out. They had no more AC power. They couldn't do anymore. They had some battery power left, so they were able to keep stuff 
cool for a short while, but not for a long term. Remember when I said the NRC mandates we have to shut it down, maintain it shut down, cool down and pre prevent release of radioactivity to the environment. They failed in that respect. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. So our design here, large containment, and I apologize if you folks can't see that well, but there's nowhere good to stand, to be honest with you. Um, the entire containment structure, this pressurizer area up here, the st steam generators come around here. So what basically is gonna happen, it's a natural circulation plant. There are no pumps. Oh, please. What yes. I'll get to that in a second. Thank you for that segue though. Um, so what's gonna happen, as the water heats up, going through the reactor core, it's gonna come up through the top, and it's gonna float down on the sides here, going over the steam generator tubes. Steam generator is nothing more than a heat exchanger, similar to a radiator in a car. It just cools something off, okay? It's gonna get cooled off, and water going through the tubes is gonna be turned into steam, and it's gonna head out to the turbine. Okay, get to that in a second. Cold water comes down on the outside, goes back inside the core, and the cycle repeats itself, okay? So, new scale power module. We talked about all the stuff that's in there. New scale plant will have 12 modules, so there's gonna be 12 of these small things. They put out 60 megawatt electric a piece, okay? So, remember when I said a current plant out there, most of them will put on anywhere from 800 megawatt to 12, 13, 1400 megawatt electric, which is a lot of electricity, all right? This one, each one puts out 600 megawatt for a total of 12 for 720 megawatts electricity. There you go, 76 feet tall, 15 feet wide. That's the whole module. <coughs> That's everything. If you notice right here, this giant radiator, remember I talked about radar? Decay heat removal system. I'm not gonna get deep into detail but this is one of our passive cooling systems. New scale reactor is designed for total passive cooling. What's the, what is a non-passive cooling? Non-passive cooling would be active cooling, which would be a pump that has to take water from someplace and pump it into the core, okay? Passive cooling does not require any pumps. It uses physics, gravity, heat transfer, no power is needed. So you're gonna find out as I go through here what I mean by that. So this is a comparison. That's what a containment structure looks like on a standard pressurized water reactor. They're very big, everything's included in there. Got steam generators, the reactor, the reactor coolant pumps. This containment is the last line of defense in case there is a loss of coolant accident in a commercial pressurized water reactor in the US today, all right? Note the water down here. This is sump areas, let's call this sump. So if they do have an issue and they have to pump water, they'll take it from any number one of sources. <coughs> Tanks, and it's the same whether it's a, a, a CE reactor, a Westinghouse reactor, a Babcock and Wilcox reactor, they're all essentially the same. There's gonna be differences in design though. AP1000 is a little bit different, I'm not gonna get into too much in that right now. Um, so they're gonna have to pump water. They have to take water from somewhere to pump it somewhere. That's what happened with Fukushima. They had to take water from somewhere to pump it somewhere else into the core. They couldn't do it, they had no power. Gonna find new scale doesn't need to do that. So, natural convection for cooling. All right, so the flow is going to come up here, going to go down. There's no, there's no cool, there's no coolant pumps required. It's just going to be hotter. Water's going to rise, going to go up, going to come down. Gravity is going to bring it down. It's going to go over the steam generator tubes. All right, and it's and the heat's going to be removed by the steam generator tubes. Uh, One twentieth the size of a large reactor cores, seismically ro robust. Okay, so. Seismic concerns are always out there. Every plant today in the United States has to withstand a seismic event. All right, I don't know the exact you know seismic number it has to withstand because they're all a little bit different based on where they're at. We are also that same way. 
This is going to sit in a giant pool that you're going to see in a second in a seismic building. The seismic building is going to be rated to handle more seismic activity than any plant in the U.S. today. It's also going to be aircraft impact resistant coming out of 9-11. Uh, so plants have to design for that, that a fully loaded jetliner with fuel can smash into it, won't destroy it. It's going to be, uh, and so let's see. So we talked about that, yeah. Seismic, impact resistant, missile resistant. That's what I want. So we have defense in depth, protect the release of radiation to the environment. First one is the fuel cladding. All right, then we got direct to pressure vessel, and then this containment structure. There's valves in the vessel that'll open up and flood the containment. When it floods the containment, it puts the water in contact with the containment itself. <clears throat> and what's going to happen, you'll see in another scenario, these modules are going to be inside of a giant pool. Basically, it's what it is. It's called the ultimate heat sink. It's going to take the, it's going to take the heat away just by a conduction method. And, it's, and I'll get into a little more detail how that's going to happen in a second. So, what happens once we make some steam and goes out? Coming out of the top here, I told you the heat gets transferred to the, through the steam generator tubes. The steam generator tubes are nothing but a heat exchanger, just like any other heat exchanger you'll see in a coal plant, any other plant, your radiator's a heat exchanger, any other heat exchanger you see around. It's just going to transfer the energy. So when the hot water goes over the steam generator tubes, that's going to give the energy to the water that's in the steam generator tubes on the inside, it's going to turn the steam, it's going to come right out the top here, and it's going to go to the turbine generator. From here on out, it's basically the same as a coal fire plant, a gas plant, or any other plant. It's a turbine generator, takes the steam, turns the turbine, which turns the generator, makes electricity. Comes down, the steam comes down, through uh, in a condenser. It gets condensed either by water, air, and it goes back into the feed system and it'll come right back through and then go back to our vessel. Like I said, downstream here, go into a turbine, it's nothing different than, than you'll find at the coal plant, wherever they are around here. If you could let me hold on and I'll finish this, I appreciate that. Um, I may answer your question. So this is what it looks like. This is the reactor building. Okay, It's a safety related seismic building. So what is safety? We talked about what safety related means, right? Okay, It's required to shut down, maintain shutdown, prevent release of radioactivity. Safety related components are very expensive. They have to be designed to a higher standard. They have to be manufactured, built, and tested to a significantly higher standard than non-safety related components. And there's a reason for that. They're there to protect the core and radiation. So that is the rationale behind that. So they're held to a higher standard in all facets of it. <coughs> Current plants out there today have a lot of safety related components. I know, I operated them. Tons of them. It adds complexity. Okay, they're still safe, but as you've seen in Fukushima, if you lose power, you can't pump water anymore. We don't need any power. The NRC has issued a safety evaluation on a new scale design reactor. We do not need any AC or DC power to keep this reactor safe. None. Not safety related, not non-safety related, not anything. We don't need any emergency diesel generators. We don't need any pumps. Everything is passive cooled system. So these will sit here, these reactor modules will sit inside multi-million gallons of water. All right, I'll show you another view. Just a top view, okay. 12 modules, six on either side. Something happens and we need to cool the core. this pool will do it. So now what's going to happen? Is the pool going to get hot? Of course it is. It's going to take away heat. It could take away heat from all 12 modules. All right. As the water gets hotter, 
it's eventually going to just vaporize away, just like you would if water was getting hotter in your pot. It's just going to go away. So, that okay? Current plants in the U.S., they did something economy of scale. You've probably seen it where they're constantly upgrading their power. Uh, they're making bigger plants because you've got a, you know, a finite amount of people that are going to operate them. So why not make more electricity? Why not make more money and put more power onto the grid for people to use? And that was the running thought for decades. If I can produce more electricity, that's a good thing. Okay? And it's, it's not a bad thing. Producing electricity is a good thing. However, you have very large cores, very powerful, very a lot of power in them. Okay, they have to be cooled. All right, because they're so large, they need large pumps and a large amount of water from all different sources to be able to do that. The new scale has a different economy of scale. We're going smaller. There's a very small power density in each module right here significantly smaller amount of fuel compared to the large cores. So we can readily cool that reactor core transferring the heat to this pool. Well, eventually the water's gonna go away. You know, keep on transferring enough heat, it's gonna go away. We have cooling systems that'll cool this pool. They're non-safety related. Well, as I just mentioned to you, that means they're not needed to maintain the safety of the plant. They're not needed to prevent the release of radioactivity to the public. Why is that? To understand a little bit more, let's talk about plant risk. Core damage frequency. Basically, it's based on every situation, what is the chance that you are going to damage the fuel? If you don't damage the fuel, you're safe. If you do damage the fuel, that's not good because now you could also lose the containment, you could put radioactivity to the public, obviously not something anyone who wants to do, that's what happened in Fukushima, okay? They damaged the core, they couldn't cool anything, and you had large releases. Current plants, well here's the NRC goal, it's 10 to the minus fourth, that's core damage frequency, okay? So a smaller number is better, 10 to the minus tenth is significantly better than 10 to the minus fourth, all right? Operating PWRs and operating BWRs are meet the NRC's goal, 10 to the minus fourth to 10 to the minus sixth. That's a probability that you will damage the core or not damage the core based on different events that you have to analyze for. So all these plants, my plant included, we had to analyze uh, loss of cooling accident, we had to analyze a turbine trip, we had to analyze loss of offsite power, feed water malfunction, all these different stuff. We had to analyze all of them and say, Based on what we have, are we still going to be safe? New light water reactors with ag active systems are in this 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7. Passive systems, as in the AP1000, I don't know what their number is, so I'm not trying to tell you that's their, that is their core damage frequency number because I don't know, but this is a generic chart we have for the different types of reactors. It's 10 to minus 7. New scale is 10 to minus 10. So we're definitely a magnitude order different and more safer than other plants. This is currently being reviewed by the NRC and we see no problem with that number, a valid number, and they'll agree with that. So what does that mean? Probability of core damage in a new scale reactor, equipment failures is one event per module every three billion years. That's what that 10 to the minus 11th number reads, means significantly better. We don't need any AC power. We don't need any DC power. We don't need any pumps. We need the water that's already there. We need no operator actions. No other plant in this nation can say that. Okay? They can say it for like an hour, two hours, or whatever, but we can say it for indefinitely. All right? So some of the other barriers that we have. We talked a little bit about the reactor core, the RPV vessel, the containment vessel. These are all going to be below ground. 100 feet below, below ground. So our ground level at the top is zero and everything else is below that. We also have a biological shield wall that's gonna be on top. The reactor building, as I mentioned before, seismic, so it's built to withstand design basis earthquake, all right? 
aircraft impact resistant, built to withstand a large jetliner full of fuel smashing into it or a missile smashing into it and not be destroyed and not damage the reactors. So, I told you before, all I need is the water that was in there. Okay? So, here we go. We talked about uh, my little radiators here, and we talked also about flooding the uh, containment structure. So the water surrounding it, and I know those of you in the uh, back can't see this, one second we're going to have 10 megawatt thermal approximately, one hour left. So it's, it's going to be a 200 megawatt thermal plant, all right? Um, megawatt thermal is what the reactor puts out, megawatt electric is what the generator will put out. So in one hour it's going to be 2.2 megawatts, one day 1.1, and that's just with normal decay heat removal by these systems. Every other, every plant has that. It's a, usually a percentage of the total full power. All right, so as the level's going down, our most conservative values is that water will last for 30 days. And so what do I mean by most conservative? Well, before we, when we're st operating, this water level will have to be a certain level. As you can see, it's the containment vessel is not submerged, but pretty close to submerged in the water. So we would have to say the water level is the lowest we'll ever allow it to be. Okay, that's conservative. Well, and there's a temperature requirement in, these, in this water because it has to take away heat. So the colder it is, the better it takes away heat. The hotter it is, the less heat it'll take away before it starts evaporating, all right? So we say it's also the hottest that we'll ever allow it to be and still operate. We don't take any credit for, as the water vapor goes up, it's eventually gonna condense on the roof and drop back into the pool. Could take credit for that, but we don't take credit for any of the stuff. We say, what's the worst case scenario we have? And that water will last 30 days. Within that, after that 30 days, these cores will be cooled just by the air that's running past them. No additional water supply required. Now, would we put water in there? Sure, if we had that capability, we would. Do we have to, to keep the core safe? No. Just the airflow going by there will keep it cool indefinitely. All righty. Hopefully I asked your, answered your question by now. Go ahead. Okay, so how are we gonna make it cheaper, easier? Well, we're gonna have significantly less safety related components. Everything's gonna be modularized. So with this small little reactor that I have, relatively small, I mean compared to big reactors, it's not small, I need a small turbine. I don't need these giant turbines that commercial plants have, large commercial plants have, and they have all sorts of auxiliary systems and they have to be brought in by 100 different pieces at a time. So the vendors we're starting to work with, are, it's like a plug and play kind of thing. They have small packages. And that's pretty standard throughout the world. I mean, they have small units they can easily plug in there. It's cheaper, it requires less auxiliary systems, et cetera. Easier to maintain, easier to test, there's not much to them. I'm not, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's nothing to them, but compared to the large units, which are very extensive, a lot less. The reactor module can be shipped in two to three different parts. So unlike some of the much larger units, you've got to fabricate many, many different parts and build them on site, which takes time. It's kind of like a stick built home versus a prefab where you just bring in a couple big parts, right? We're gonna be able to bring in a lot of prefab factory fabrication, all right, drive down the cost, bring them in and do minimal assembly on site. <clears throat> Our less safety related systems, less testing, just because of the safety related systems. We'll be testing safety systems. We just have significantly less of them to test, significantly less to build, okay? Less pumps, less valves, et cetera. So technology validation. This is just, you know, okay, how do I know it's gonna work? You know, the NRC's not gonna let us just say it's gonna work. We're not gonna let us say, nor sh would you or should you say, oh yeah, I believe it's gonna work. We have to go through a, a significant amount of testing. We have to prove all the validation. We have a, a, a 
test facility, new scale integral system test facility at the Oregon State University. It's comprised of a mock-up of a vessel and a mock-up of a pressurizer and we run all sorts of tests to evaluate what the engineers have said, make sure it meets the requirements or give them the data that it's not meeting or whatever we have to change. Also significant testing, Canada, Italy, Germany on steam generator tubes, control rod assemblies, et cetera, et cetera. So this has been going on for years and it will continue to go on. We're going to fine tune everything as we move forward. Integrated system validation completed. Okay, what is this? This is basically, this is our control room. It's our simulator now since there's not a control room built. 12 modules, each of them have a separate independent control station. Okay, let me point out our HSI, human system interface. In the past, and in the plan I operated, there were switches, pumps, valves, gauges, all over the place. I would, our, my control room was about these two rooms together. Had to run, run around to all of them. There'd be alarms everywhere up here we had to deal with. <clears throat> the new scale plant, using the latest in technology, most all of this stuff will be fully automated. Okay, All the reactor protection system is going to be automated. Control functions will be automated. Less chance of any human errors occurring. Okay, obviously there's going to be operators there monitoring to make sure everything works right. It's all going to be instrumented. If something's not working right, the operator will get alarm and he'll take whatever action he needs from there. So this ISV testing, we did a performance base of the hardware, software, personnel, three crews of six licensed operators. They trained in a simulator class, or excuse me, they trained similar to a licensed class, lectures, training in the simulator, and then we put them through the test of all the stuff that could happen in the design of a new scale reactor. The NRC was there for part of those things, evaluating them, give them reports, and making sure we're following all the requirements. Why is new scale different as far as what we can do other than generating electricity? We envision we can use different modules for desalinization. Most of Africa doesn't have enough water, right? Middle East. There's a huge desalinization place where they have to take the seawater. We can use some modules for that. Hydrogen production can also minimize uh, for hydrogen cars, hydrogen fuel cars. Right now we find, need to find a cheap way to make hydrogen. Oil refineries. We can also power oil refineries for, with our carbon free energy so that way what oil has to be used is not being produced by a coal plant. Also mission critical facilities. This is a big thing up in Canada. Canada's looking into new scale right now. All right, mining areas and stuff up there. This plant can just sit up there. They cannot produce the electricity they need without bringing in volumes of diesel fuel, which is extremely expensive. We also load follow. All right, so the design is to be able to load follow with wind and solar to be able to make up where the sun's not shining or wind's not blowing. So there's a lot of flexibility in this. We can use a module here. Uh, a single module can do 50 million gallons a day, a 12 module plant can go ahead and desalinate for the city of uh, Cape Town, South Africa, 3.8 million people. So although it doesn't sound like we make a lot of electricity compared to other people, there's a lot of stuff we can do. Okay, so we all hear about carbon. It's a bad thing, it's polluting our air, and it is. A lot of people are recognizing that nuclear, especially safe nuclear, is the way to go to be able to address carbon. All right, Union of Concerned Scientists, a big watchdog for the nuclear industry, has said that nuclear power should be part of the mix, needs to be. MIT study that worked with INL here agrees with the same thing. UN study, even Google, and uh, that guy that ran Microsoft, Bill Gates, needs to be part of the mix. We just can't build enough solar and wind to make up all the power that the world needs to meet the goals that are out there. We also have island mode loss of power. What this is, is we, if we lose off-site power, we're designed to be able to power up our own plant with one of our, with one of our reactor providing all the power. So if they lose an off-site grid, catastrophe happens, we lose the grid, we can pick up the grid and power everyone else when, it's, when, when all the pipes and wires are back in. Uh, I told you about the reliance on the natural vents and resilient aircraft. 
were designing all our stuff with cybersecurity. That's the stuff that everyone else had to do retrofit or try to do retrofit. Mm -hmm. We're building it. We're also building it high altitude EMP pulse. Not sure why we're doing that, but someone decided we need to do an EMP pulse resistant reactor. So, how is it affected by the MP? Pulse? Hopefully, not at all. That's why we're designing it against it. <laughs> I can't tell you. I really don't know that much about it, to be honest, about that part. Right size in the EPZ zone. Okay. Currently in the United States today, every nuclear power plant has to have a 10 mile emergency preparedness zone in any direction. And they would have to be, and they work with federal, state, local authorities, and they would have to be prepared to evacuate the local population if an accident happened. Okay? <clears throat> Fukushima, accident happened. They evacuated tons of people. All right? A lot of people died due to that evacuation and the length they were gone. They didn't die directly because of Fukushima, but you could call it an ind indirect result. They were gone, elderly, sick, hospitals that didn't have power anymore. You know, people died from that. TVA has submitted, and TVA is working with, with UAMPS, submitted uh, an application to the NRC for the Clinch River site, which they're looking at the same SMR that UAMPS is. And the NRC has issued a preliminary evaluation saying our safety evaluation, or excuse me, our, our EPZ zone only needs to go to the site boundary. So there's nothing beyond that that would have to be concerned of. Why do they do that? Well, it's a testament to the safetyness of this, of this particular new scale design. No other designs, just a new scale design. Preliminary safety evaluation, the final's not done yet. Okay, so the NRC recognizes because of the features in this, we should not have to ever evacuate people from the surrounding areas. All right, a lot of research collaborations. We work with a lot of folks here, Oregon State University, University of Idaho, Boise State, and universities throughout the entire country. So it's just not a bunch of folks sitting in Corvallis doing their own thing. We got the biggest and best minds from throughout the country because we realize this is the future and this is the way we need to go, and internationally. What about fuel? That's a big deal, right? I mean, that's the second thing besides, you know, melting your thing. What are you going to do with the used fuel? It's, it's an extremely valid question. Currently in the United States, all the plants are required to hold their fuel, store their fuel on their sites. That was a retrofit. They were never designed to do that. The federal government was going to take it a long time ago and deal with it. All right, New Scale is a 60-year design plant. We're building our, to be able to store all of our fuel right there. It's going to sit in a spent fuel pool for a while until it cools off and then it's going to go into uh, dry cast storage. It's a proven method that's been going on in the industry for 10, 15 years at least. All right. Had no issues with them. They're safe, they're secure, they're inside a security zone. All right. We plan on using that. The used fuel management storage and disposal is regulated by the NRC and the DOE. So the DOE, the federal government, has final responsibility for disposing of fuel. But what is also currently happening behind the scenes with a lot of the DOE stuff is uh, we're devising ways to reprocess cheaper and to use this spent fuel for other research reactors or power reactors. Bill Gates' Terra Power Reactor was going to use some of the spent fuel. That's kind of been put on hold, the whole China thing. But all those, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Those technologies are not here yet, okay? Most of them. Reprocessing is, but we don't reprocess in this country. We're very little anyways, not as much as they do over in France. Uh, okay, so that's kind of talked about that. Here's the used fuel pool. This is where we would store it with water for five to ten years, under 60 feet of water. So where are we? Okay, this is the long hill that we've been climbing up. Started in 2000, 2016, I told you, you know, New Year's Eve, 10 o'clock at night, uh, DCA was completed, and COLA submittal scheduled for 2021. Bear will talk a little bit more about that. We're looking at first SMR delivery in 2020s, okay? The key that we have as an engineering firm, and I can only speak for the engineering firm, is to meet all our commitments on time and on budget. So far, we've done all that. And it's very rare to hear that in the nuclear industry because, frankly, it's never been done. 
It is. It's, it hasn't been done. And I'm sad to say that, but it's true. Uh, okay. We believe at New Scale the future of energy is here. And we think it's, uh, we're going to make it a reality here, right here in Idaho. Fair? Quick question, ma'am. I know I held you off for a while there. Well, so there aren't any, New Scale doesn't have any operating plants? No, ma'am. Do the uh, safety issues multiply by the number of modules that you have? No. We're designing it for 12 modules. So, site boundaries? So that, site plan. correct. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're a little, a little behind schedule. Hopefully I'll speed up and go efficiently through this as possible. <coughs> yeah. Megawatts electric. Megawatts electric. So what I'm going to do is focus on Idaho Falls Power perspective in the project and give the audience a chance to see the things that we're thinking about as an electric utility and a utility that has a responsibility <clears throat> and the obligation to keep the lights on in Idaho Falls 24-7, 365 and the, the decisions that we have to go through in order to look out in the future and plan for reliable energy uh, resources for, for, our, uh, for our city. This is a uh, from February 22nd, I grabbed a colder winter day to just go through to explain to everybody what's going on with our supply and demand picture. So the line across the top is what we call our system load. So you'll see here it peaked on this day about 138 megawatts in the morning, around 8, 9 o'clock in the morning in the, in the winter is when we set our typical peak. That's when everybody's finally got to work and they're kicking on heaters at work and you still, you know, all the heaters and everything were still running at home from that morning and lights are on. So pretty normal load curve. What you'll see here is this purple is Idaho Falls Power, our owned hydro. So the bulb turbines and gem state plan. A lot of people think that we make all of our own power here and we're self-sufficient. Um, it's pretty far from the truth. We only produce about 40% of our electricity on average um, here locally for ourselves. 60% of our electricity comes from the Bonneville Power Administration. So it comes off of uh, predominantly the Columbia River, the four lower snake dams, you know, Grand Coulee down to Bonneville, and then also Columbia Generating Station, which is the one um, working nuclear power plant in the Northwest. So we have a little bit of nuclear power in our portfolio. This Bonneville contract is a long-term purchase contract. We've purchased from Bonneville since the 1970s. This current contract goes through 2028. Uh, you'll see also in here, there's this yellow. We own a piece of a wind farm called Horse Butte. It's built up on the hill. It's not any of the ones you can see. It's up over the ridge. If you're ever up at Ryrie Reservoir and you kind of look back up in there in the uh, but past Ryrie, you can see some wind turbines. That's actually Horse Butte. We have three megawatts of that wind project that we did with UAM. So it's a UAM's project that we're a participant in. Notice here um, in the winter, not much wind going on. When it's cold, the wind doesn't blow. It's high pressure. And that's a normal phenomenon. Uh, so what do we do in these times? We go to the wholesale market. When we're short electricity, we have to rely on the market to purchase that to meet our needs. In times that we have a little bit of surplus, we will sell that into the market and bring that revenue back to buy electricity for the times that we don't and or you know, bring that revenue in to help subsidize and lower our rates to keep them as low as possible. This is the part that gives us concern. I mean, obviously we don't have enough resources to meet our own needs at all times, but that's normal for an electric utility. Here's last summer, a typical summer afternoon or typical summer day. Uh, you can see where we set our peaks in the afternoon and into the evening. Our, once again, our hydro contracts do not meet all of our resource needs. We try to shape those because our Bonneville contract allows us to shape the output of that hydro system to meet our needs, but it doesn't have all the flexibility we need. 
Uh, you'll see here on this day we had a little bit better wind profile, more wind in the afternoon, which is normal. Um, but we're still short during these peak periods. Uh, it's not as big a problem during these first peak periods because currently we're seeing a lot of solar. Uh, massive amounts of solar coming out of California. So to go to the wholesale market during these first hours is really inexpensive. They're actually paying people in California and in the wholesale market, a lot of those hours, they will pay you to take electricity. So they'll say, here's our megawatts and $10, take it from us because they also get uh, tax credits and, uh, and renewable energy credits to just produce it. So it's interesting economics of what's going on around California. So as you see more and more solar penetration, you're gonna see this you know, area of the curve become a lot more depressed. So I'm not worried about this area. The problem is when you get it about past four or five o'clock in this area, prices go from minus 10, minus $20 in the wholesale market to 130, $150 a megawatt because they're having to idle gas plants and coal plants during this period to meet that evening peak as the solar drops off and everybody gets home from work and, and really picks up on that. Same thing with the residential solar. Everybody's, especially in California, sort of become a lot more prevalent in Oregon, Washington, and even here we have, we have a net metering program. That load that you're, you're the generation people get on their roof is great, it offsets that demand, but as soon as that falls off, all that demand goes on the electric utility and we need to meet those needs. So a lot of people say, well, I got solar panels, I'm fine, I don't need the electric utility. Well, they'll quickly figure out when you disconnect your power that when the sun isn't out, you're sitting in the dark. It's just the way it is without adding batteries or some other sort of generation. So the grid does all that balancing for it. So looking ahead is we try to figure out what we want our portfolio to be for the city of Idaho Falls. And these are long conversations that we have had and continue to have um, with the Idaho Falls Power Board, which is the city council, about what do we want our, our resource picture to look like. Um, you can see there in the winter and the summer, there's periods where we're short and there's periods where we're long. In the spring, we're predominantly long electricity with the hydro runoff. But the city's continuing to grow. Our summer peaks are growing about 1.8% per year. So we're short now in the summer um, peak periods. It's just gonna get worse as time goes on. Our winter peaks continue to decline, um, but that decline is starting to level off. A lot of that's due to conversion of natural gas. People are converting electric space heat to some natural gas. And then also we do um, heat pumps and then also energy efficiency programs. So we've been really aggressive here to try and save um, those kilowatts and say those megawatts so we can put off having to make these heavy investments into uh, power plants. Um, and then once again, annual energy consumption is starting to grow in the city. After the recession from about 2010 to 2015, we really didn't have any load growth in the city. A lot of that, we still kept our conservation programs. The city population wise was growing, our customer counts were growing, but our annual energy consumption wasn't really growing. That's starting to change. And I think a lot of that's due to the commercial sector. <clears throat> There's a new company that came into town that uh, we're just um, connecting to our system that takes uh, the starch from potatoes and makes plastics out of it. So it's bioplastics. Um, that plant, and it's, and it's in a small scale now, uses uh, about a megawatt and a half to two megawatts of electricity for that process. Our system on average is around 90 megawatts. So a megawatt and a half is, you know, you're looking at a, you know, <clears throat> over one and a half, you know, somewhere around 2% load growth from one customer. And their vision, they're, they're already looking at other land to buy. And so this could be a five, 10 megawatt customer, which we want to serve because there's a lot of really good paying jobs in that technology. And that's also good for the environment. So the city's growing, which is a good thing, but it also creates demands on the electric utility. The other thing that's, that's one of our goals is to maintain our carbon-free portfolio. This is a goal that other utilities hope to get to in 20, 30, 40 years from now. We're already there. And we probably don't tout that enough and tout our own horn that our base portfolio, our Bonneville contract, which is all hydro, some nuclear, and then our owned resources are emissions-free and carbon-free. So, you know, Idaho Power recently came out with a goal to be carbon-free in their portfolio in 2040, um, a VISTA similar type time range. We're already there and also have cheapest rates in the state. So we're very fortunate here. 
We also want to limit our risk exposure to the market. We don't want to just rely on the market. The market can be good, but it's also if you do this transition and everybody else is short energy, you're going to see wholesale prices really spike. We saw that in early 2000 with the energy crisis. We had a drought year. Um, a lot of people blame that, oh, it was the Enron years. There's actually a lot more that went into that. It was a drought year. Um, you had fires on some of the transmission lines, and market prices went to um, you know $1,000, $2,000. We've recently seen the last um, couple of years a lot of volatility come back into the market. This last winter, we saw $1,000 a megawatt pricing sustained for a four-day period during the cold snap that hit the Pacific Northwest. You spend millions and millions of dollars really quickly when wholesale prices do that. So there's a risk with being in the market, but the market can be really nice to take those, you know, you know, the, the surpluses and deficits out of it. So no matter what, we're going to always rely on it. We don't want that to be the, we'll just go to the market all the time because there's risk with that. The other thing is we want to look at the resource attributes that, of whatever generation we buy. We want it to be base load but flexible. So base load means it's going to be there when we need it. So it's going to be there producing energy on those cold mornings and we're going to be able to rely on those hot afternoons and to serve our customer needs. <clears throat> but then we also want to be flexible so when there's overproduction of solar and the wholesale market's in a negative state, we can take advantage of that, ramp down our generation and economically react to the marketplace to have flexible generation to integrate those renewables, those other renewables that are coming online. So the value proposition for the Carbon Free Power Project that's being developed by UAMPS, of which we're a member of, and I'll get into that a little more in a minute, is a contract to not exceed $55 a megawatt. And $55 a megawatt comes from a, that's the current price for a combined cycle natural gas plant. So we looked at the price of a, and you know, that's, that's your other altern, alternate source of energy currently that is you know, base load, dispatchable, and you can count on it is the uh, most efficient combined cycle natural gas plant. So all in with fuel cost is $55 a megawatt. So that's where when New Scale approached us and UAMPS to say, how about we, we can deliver a nuclear plant that's competitive? And we said, well, we define competitive as a natural gas plant. And then we, we can also pick up the attributes of it fits within these new legislation that's coming out to be um, clean energy bills. So California, Washington, New Mexico have clean energy bills to require no carbon emissions from their electricity generation. So that's current state legislation and there's talk of even you know federally putting that le legislation in place through carbon taxes. Um, Canada has a carbon tax. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to future proof our energy portfolio so that if there's carbon legislation, carbon taxes, or if there's just an economic advantage to having a carbon-free portfolio so we can sell our generation at a premium, we want to make sure we maintain that strategic advantage. Uh, it, it really is a, a market-based response to greenhouse gas emissions and any regulations that might roll out from, from the Environmental Protection Agency and, and, and clean air emissions. Complements electric markets. So the markets in the West are starting to, or continuing to evolve into a more organized um, independent system operator where you're bidding energy in and out hourly. We want to be able to have a resource so we can flex up and down based upon the price signals we see from the marketplace. And then, like I mentioned before, we want to maintain our, our emissions-free portfolio. So what are other options? Because everybody says, well, why nuclear? Are you just you know, in love with this technology or any other technology? There's pros and cons to everything. If there was a silver bullet, I'd, we'd just go and do that because I'd love to just hit the easy button and not have to go through <laughs> a lot of this other stuff. But everything's, you know, the, the term, everything's got hair on it. No matter what, what you choose, there's pros and cons. It's just energy is that fundamental. Problem with solar is it cannot produce energy in the morning and evening peaks to meet customer needs. You have a, the good thing about solar is you can pretty much count on it being there. You can count on it being there during those defined hours. So it's very different than wind. Wind you don't know. You have some forecasting, but I, I cannot tell you what my wind farm is going to produce three days from now. I got some guesstimates for the next couple days based upon pressure ridges, but if it, you know, if they say what's your production out of your wind facility tomorrow morning at four o'clock in the morning, 
I don't know. It, it's, it's, a very, it's very much a guess. Solar is nice because you, you know the sun's going to come up and you know about what you're going to get, with the exception of some cloud cover, but it, it is a good resource for that. But it, is it feasible to store it? I'll get to that. <laughs> Wind, like I hit, hit on earlier, it's not dispatchable, or to, and you can't count on it count on to be there for your system needs and your long-term planning. Horse Butte wind, and this is a pretty good capacity factor. Everybody lives here in Idaho Falls. You know the wind blows a lot. So 35% capacity factor. What that means is on an annual basis, we have three megawatts. We get 35% of that annually. So it's a three megawatt facility. We get one megawatt on average out of it. A lot of times it might be at three. A lot of times it's a zero and everything in between. But annually, it's going to produce energy 35% of the time. Most of your nuclear plants, you're looking at a 95 to 98% capacity factor. I mean, they're just up and running all the time. Natural gas plants are a 90 to 92% capacity factor, depending on what their maintenance cycles are. Uh, the other thing is people say, well, with wind, you just build more of it and get diversity. Well, that's great, but you can't get it from A to B. They say, well, the, the planes have a lot of wind. Just build it there and import it here. You're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars of transmission investment, and I will tell you it is getting near impossible to site high-voltage transmission lines. Nobody wants them in their backyard or anywhere near their backyard, and they're very expensive. Idle Power is trying to build the Gateway West and Boardman to Hemingway line. It's a 20-year process, and they're still trying to get through it. I mean, we've tried, you know, we're still working on siting a really small 161 kV line around town, and that's been, you know, since 2008. And you're talking crossing four or five states with 500 kV. It's just not, not a, a reality from a, you know, getting it from a windy place to a non-windy place and, and back. And there's some, I mean, wind's been a great resource for the region, so solar. Uh, batteries, currently it's, I mean, grid utility scale batteries are lithium ion. That's what everybody's deploying. There's a little bit of, of playing around with, with flow batteries, where you have a medium that you take it through to get the electricity. But they're still not on the cost and scale that makes sense. Um, APS put out a, a proposal to purchase, I think it was 100 megawatts, which is the largest in the country, one of the larger in the world of batteries. They had a half a megawatt battery currently in lithium ion. It caught on fire. They injured a bunch of firemen trying to put it out. So it brings in new safety concerns, and then also disposal of also lithium ion, and then rare earth metals, minerals. So batteries have a place to replace the power sector. That gets tough, So and, and the economics aren't there. So um, in the future, with new technologies, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of work and time being put into that. It would be nice to see it get there, because they, they do hold a lot of promise, but it's not currently there. What, what, uh is Toyota shooting for? I understand it's not lithium ion. I don't know. I'm not aware of what technology they're using. Yeah. Uh, conservation programs. We continue to invest heavily in conservation programs. We spend um, just a little under a million dollars per year. Are there any opportunities in terms of uh, geography in this area for pump storage? Um, I don't, I think there is some opportunity in here. There's some big pump storage projects that are being proposed in Washington, some, like, some that are 800 megawatts, massive scale pump storage projects. Uh, the latest economics I've seen on those are around 80 to $120 a megawatt. So still waiting for the, but there's a lot of potential for pump storage to, to get to where it makes sense. Uh, conservation programs, we spend, anywhere from 800000 to a million dollars a year on conservation programs. It's an interesting business where we spend a million dollars a year to try and convince people and find ways to use less of our product, but it's what we do because, you know, if we can save a kilowatt, then we, it means it's better for the environment, better for the customers, and if, if we can do it at a price that's less than that next piece of generation that we have to buy, then that's a good thing for, for the customer. So we continue to invest heavily into our conservation programs. Anybody who's on Idle Falls Power System, if you don't know about our conservation programs, please you know, go on our website, take advantage of those. Those are great opportunities for you know, anything from LED um, light bulb change outs to ductless heat pumps and insulation windows, all that stuff. So I encourage you to do a plug for our conservation program. 
Um, and the other thing though with conservation, the city's demand's growing too fast. City's growing to the point that we're not keeping up with to be able to turn that just to conservation programs. The other thing is electrific electrification of the transportation sector. It's a big push for electric vehicles. Well, that com comes on, everybody says, well, that'll be a lot better for the environment to not burn fossil fuels. We gotta find generation then to, to replace that with. Um, there's talk of the Idaho National Lab looking at converting their um, bus fleet to electric. That's a massive amount of electricity that we're gonna have to supply to that. And we need to make sure that we're looking down the road to serve those needs and everybody else's needs as they look to potentially um, buy electric vehicles. Um, you mentioned earlier that $55 a megawatt um, was what, what uh, the COP was shooting for as defining an economical mm -hmm. uh, producer, is that correct? Yes. So just to tie that to the, um, the new scale conversation, has, has a study been done to estimate what the total cost of the plant? We'll get to that. Okay. Yep, yep. It's a good segue here in about two more slides. So. I want to hit a little bit more on the future and the, and the power supply planning because a lot of people think that it's, it is an easy solution. So E3 is a entity out of California that does a lot of consulting and modeling for California for their state legislature, California utilities, and those entities. They also do some stuff up in the Northwest because they've built a multi-million dollar model of all the resources, transmission lines, and the electric grid in the West. So you can play around with, well, what happens when you do this? What happens when you do that? One of the things that they've been looking at is when we start removing all the coal plants off the grid, what does the grid look like? So you have states of Oregon, Washington, California saying, we're getting rid of all the coal. You're not allowed to import carbon emitting resources into the state anymore. Shut down all the coal plants. Great. What do we do from here though to keep the lights on? The grid was built around these. As they did the study, and it just came out in February, it'd be extremely costly and impractical to replace all the carbon emitting generation capacity with solar, wind, and storage. You can get to 30, 40% carbon free pretty easy. California's already there at 30%. You can get to 50% pretty easy. A lot of states are saying we want to be 100% carbon free in our electricity sector. When you start getting past 70%, especially 80%, the costs go exponential because you're having to get rid of natural gas plants at that point, which is really what backs up all these other resources. The other thing that's of concern is um, the Northwest is anticipated need <coughs> new capacity in the near term. There's thousands of megawatts of coal that's coming offline in the next four years. And the market's not flush with electricity. So that's what gives me concern of somebody. When I go to the market, is the market going to be there and at what price? And the practice of relying on, the, on market purchases is really putting us in a risky place from a capacity standpoint and to have resource adequacy, making sure that utilities aren't relying overly on the market. Because if everybody in the room, and I, I sit in meetings with all the other utilities in the West, they say, well, who's building generation to replace all this coal? And everybody's going, not me. And you're going, all right. And everybody's resource planning says, well, I'm going to rely on the market. And you look around and go, we are the market. We're the generating companies. We're going to go to, we're all going to go in the room and say, that's okay, we'll go to the market on those cold days and it won't be there. So that's the concern I have three, four, five years from now. So the development hypothesis, and I call it a high, because it's, it's not a firm plan because we're still working through how to navigate this. And it really is a, a fluid process of trying to drive that price down. So New Scale pursues the design certification application, which they're currently doing right now, should be done in um, the next year. UAMPS will pursue the combined operating license application, since they're the, gonna be the construction company for it. Is there a, what's the barrier for applying for the NOLA? Is it DCA complete? Is there anything between DCA complete and submit? No, having the DCA complete, yeah. And you can start working on your combined, your COLA prior to that. You just need to have your DCA prior to filing for your COLA. So your COLA is gonna take two to three years to compile all of that, and then you'll file that with the NRC. And I got a, I got a, a graph in here that shows that. So the value proposition is $55 a megawatt economic test. And that test is what gets to your point. We have what's called the LCOE model in our contract. So we agreed that this is a long-term cost of energy. We said, well, you have to deliver this project 
on budget, on time for $55 a megawatt. And the other thing is, and you know, I always tell Mike, plug his ears, Mike's gonna take all the risks. I don't want, you know, and DOE and those entities, I'm not gonna put that risk on Idaho Falls. I don't think that we should be the entity that is in the forefront of developing first of kind technology. I think it's great that it's gonna be here, potentially. I think it's great that we have a national lab here to support this, but that's what they do. It's not what we do as Idaho Falls Power. We're about keeping the lights on at the lowest possible cost reliably. I hate to slow you down, is there any tolerance in that $55 uh, to, to take into consideration the valuation of all those other attributes that are mm -hmm. good? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense to throw away a wonderful opportunity. Right. Uh, it, you know, yeah. just because we're at $56 or $58 right. per kilowatt yeah. hour. So we had to set. We had to set a target, and actually the original number was $65, and then we went and reworked it, and we moved it down to 55 and new scale goes, and we're like, well, that's where we think natural gas is at now, and you get, and things are going well, and they said, all right, we, we can yeah, we can stick this there. This is a problem that plants are having around the country, yeah. is that there's no valuation for all those benefits, mm -hmm. right. and then yeah. some PUC someplace just throws away a perfectly fine digital power plant yep. because it's yeah. a few dollars over their kilowatt hour. Yeah. It is a tough. It is a tough question. Yeah, 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 yeah. So to answer this question, you do have flexibility. No, no currently, right now, our contract is structured at fifty-five dollars a megawatt. If they came in at fifty-five and a half dollars, we would have to go back, based upon our power sales agreement, and talk to all the governing entities of all the people that signed power sales agreements to say, are we okay with fifty-five and a half dollars? If we, if the answer is no. Um, in the contract agreement, since they missed their $55 price target, they refund all of our money that we've put in to develop this project. The risk is on them to hit the price target. Now, the governing boards could say 55 and a half is close enough, and we resign it, but we had to set a number and hold them to it without having that sliding scale. Um, the project development risk. Department of Energy has stepped up in a big way and continues to step up in a big way to support this technology. Um, UAMPs, new scale floor, everybody's taking pieces of this risk and pieces of the project. The other thing is construction risk. It's shared via construction, the contracts that are in place. We as a end entity do not want to take and will not take all of the construction risk. We will take the same construction risk that we would have with building a natural gas plant, but we don't want to take this first of kind development and construction risk. The other thing is the AP1000 lesson learned. AP1000 went to, and those plants being constructed, they started construction on those at about 30% design, maybe 40% at the most. Ours, we're going to get to 80% design before we start turning any dirt or doing anything. We're not gonna you know, design as we go. We're also not gonna be assembling things on site with craft labor, which gets into you know, more of Mike's area of build it modularly, modularly in a plant and then ship it to the site. Real quickly, I'll go over the DOE support. Um, we have a contract currently through 2024 where we sh have a 50-50 cost share in this development with DOE up to $119 million. So as we spend a dollar, DOE matches that with the dollar on this development process. We have is released um, in the paper recently and there's been a little bit of talk about JUMP, the JUMP program, Joint Use Modular Plant. What that is is Department of Energy is going to buy the very first module. Very first module goes to Department of Energy, which means that very first of kind design and manufacturing, they're going to build the first module for what it costs. That's going to be the most expensive module, and DOE stepped up and said, we'll do that first of kind, and then they're going to keep and use that module for testing. Obviously, it's going to be on the criteria because it's going to be a commercial plant to make sure that it you know, doesn't cause any negative aspects to the larger plant. They're going to use it for you know, methane production, looking at you know, how they, the energy and heat sources that come off of it for potential desal and all the other great things that the National Lab does. So that's going to be a little bit of their science experiment to play, to play and use with. So um, the other thing is with the jump module, they're going to pay for that first module and one twelfth of the total balance of plant. We have the option and have entered into an option agreement to look at purchasing after that, they're going to use it for 15 years. To, to take that module over after 15 years and, and, and you bring it back to serve a portion of it to serve the city's use. The thing is module two is a power purchase agreement. So DOE has said we'll buy the second module and we want to use that to power DOE facilities. So the second module is going to power the lab. 
and some other DOE facilities. So that's another way to help see this to fruition. So module one and two are already, already spoken for. And then DOE loan guarantee. Department of Energy stepped up the program and said we will guarantee the loans on this to help drive down your financing rates. Currently the spread between a DOE loan guarantee and commercial rates isn't a big spread, but there is a lot of value in there to have DOE backing, backing the project. Um, new scale support, they got they, they received a $226 million original award from DOE. That's being put towards a project. And they got another $90 million recently to help get this cross finish line. The, uh, and then site support and site agreement seismic study. The, depart, uh, the Idaho National Lab, it's going to be sited at the INL. They've been gracious enough and a good partner in this to offer up various sites. Uh, they actually gave us 30 or 40 different sites and all the site characterization with that. So we don't have to do all these seismic studies and all this other stuff because they've already studied this over the years. So that's a, a large cost savings there. Latest one here, I added this in the slide this morning, the Na National Reactor Innovation Center, NR NRIC. This is something that we've been working with the federal government, UAMPS, and everybody else's. We didn't know for sure that it was going to be placed here at the Idaho National Lab, but it was announced yesterday that it would be. What this, pro what, what this new mission for the lab is, is to work collaboratively with the commercial uh, nuclear generation sector to bring the next generation of reactors online. So what this does is it formally opens up the lab for new scale to collaborate with them on any of the design, safety, and all those other aspects to help bring this um, to fruition. So it helps further reduce that cost because now it's not just new scales, best, best and brightest. We're using the Idaho National Labs best and brightest also and all the, and all, and all the DOE facilities. Could you tell me what, um it means when you say DOE will own that first module. What is owning the module? So DOE is, will own, when I say own, they're going to purchase the full price of that module and they will be responsible for the care and operation and maintenance costs of that module for the, for the first 15 years. They will pay for the refueling. Um, New Scale with the larger plant will take care of all that because they want to make sure they maintain continuity of operations with the plant. Who owns this spent fuel? So all spent fuel is actually owned by the government, and that's at all nuclear power plants in the country. Yep. It, as soon as it as soon as it gets pulled out, it is property of the U.S. government. Yep. What's the total cost for this uh, whole thing? It's a moving number based upon all the different research and stuff. The original, I've seen numbers from three to four billion, depending on where the cost shares come in at and what other research they're gonna do around it and safety studies, because there's a lot of parallel, and that's the thing that's tough about developing this kind of technology is, there's a, the first one you spend a billions of dollars on like the design certification. That's gonna be a $800 million process but once you've done it once, you get to take that anywhere in the world. So that's one of those where that's on them to pay for. We're not going to pay for that because that's not something that we, you know, we get the value of it having a, you know, NRC certified plant, but we're not going to pay that, that first one. Yep. So what we're doing is a phase development approach. Our participation in the project is 10 megawatts. We have up to 4.8 megawatts as an option in the jump module. We're going to decide based upon the terms and conditions that come out of that, out of the negotiations between UAMPS and DOE this fall of whether we want to take up to that 4.8 megawatts. We think it'll probably be a good value because you're getting one twelfth of the plant in that module without any capital costs. So it should be the cheapest module that there is. Uh, the other th thing with the contracts, and this is one that there's some confusion sometimes around the community and with the customers saying, you guys have signed up to buy a nuclear power plant for Sakind and it's a huge risk. Not completely accurate because we have budget caps for each phase. So at the point that that long-term cost of energy model is above $55, they need to bring their costs back in line or put those risks back to where they're not setting on us as the, as the uh, power purchase entity or they refund all of our money. So it's on them to hit the $55 as we continue to refine and update that, that cost of energy model. And there's off ramps in all those phases before we do it. So the participants can say, no, too much risk. 
or don't like, you know, don't need the outcome or the, the energy anymore, and they can off ramp. So we're not fully obligated to take the energy. Um, like I said, each participant has a unilateral right to exit the project at the end of, the, uh, end of each phase. And then the project management committee approves the budget for each one of those phases and annually for the funding. So it's a very stepped approach. So I sat on the project management committee for UAMPS. So we're the ones that, so when you say UAMPS is negotiating and, and, and working on the LCOE model, UAMPS is just an extension of their members. So the project com management committee makes all the decisions pertaining to this project and instructs UAMPS of what to do. So we maintain control of the project as the off takers of this and the, and the power purchase there, how entities. How many members are there of this uh, project monitoring? There's, there's 36 members of the PMC and there's 45 members in total UMS. So most of UMS members are in this project for some level of participation. Um, yep. So it's been, and the, the big push for, oh, I should probably back up of UAMPS. I keep throwing UAMPS out there as an acronym. It's Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems. So what smaller entities like us, smaller utilities like us do is we aggregate with a larger entity, or essentially we aggregate with other similar municipal utilities or not-for-profit utilities so we can go and develop power plants or power projects, and then they also do a lot of our hourly balancing and wholesale transactions. So when we might be long energy you know, during the hour, they'll have a utility, another utility that's short, so we can work together to say, here, take my surplus, and so on and so forth, and then we'll assign you know, a fair market price for that. So we, it's like a co-op. You know, we work together to help each other out, because it'd be really hard for an entity of our side, size to build any, any uh, power plant. Horse Butte wins 56 megawatts. We have three megawatts. There's no way that we could build just a three megawatt wind farm economically. So you aggregate up to get economies of scale. Um, <clears throat> the final right to exit the project will be a project management committee decision in 2023. And with that, it's each participant's governing board that makes those decisions. So yes, I said on the PMC, we'll make the decision. Um, the budgetary decisions, but at the end of the day, the final contracts require um, for us city council approval. So like, just like the power sales agreement, it goes to city council, full disclosure, full debate, um, look at it, analyze it, and then they're, they're the ones that, that have the final vote and say on if the community participates in that. Here's a quick timeline. I've covered this uh, prior. Um, at the end of 2021, or middle 2021 in August, we're hoping to have um, the uh, construction operating license um, agreement uh, de developed and then ready to file with the NRC. And then by 2023, we hope to have an approved COLA back, sorry. And then with, if we go to construction then in 2020, late 2023, 2024 timeframe, um, I Personally, I think the project would be coming online somewhere around that 2027 time frame, which has a very good timing for us because our Bonneville contract is over, is, uh, is expires in 2028. So the Bonneville system is a finite amount. So everybody saw the blue bars, how we're matched up pretty good load and resource right now. The Bonneville system isn't getting any bigger. They're not building any more dams and they're not, Bonneville's not building any more generation. So what happens in the Northwest is loads continue to grow. There's a lot of server farms that are coming in the Northwest with our competitive power rates. Um, the, con the Northwest is population-wise, if you look at you know, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, is booming. Well, that means a lot more electric consumption. You look at electric vehicles. Bonneville system, so everybody has a preference right to buy a certain percentage. The pie is only so big. If everybody's need for the pie grows, our slice of that is gonna get smaller depending on where we set up. So there's no guarantee even post 2028 that we have as much electricity as we currently have. So our deficit could get a lot worse, even without our own load growth. So we can't just go back to Bonneville and say, we'll just take some more Bonneville energy, which would be nice because it is very cost competitive. Bonneville comes in at about $38 a megawatt currently. So it's very competitive energy, um, but it's a finite resource. So the next steps is, uh, Working on the uh, COLA and for the preferred site. So we have, um, there's a preferred site that they're currently honing in on on the far western side of the, um, of the lab. 
anticipate that to be submitted to the NRC in the late summer 2021. And then um, same thing, UAMPS and the project management committee that I sit on, we continue to engage consultants to help us because we want to make sure that we have expert eyes and consulting eyes on this and the, and the and that long-term cost of energy model to make sure that everything's transparent and if you if new scale saying oh we think this is going to cost this put that in the model we want to make sure we have experts in the industry that are also looking at going no that's going to be tough to deliver but they say well we think the price is at then we'll agree then you wear it you know new scale can take any of those cost overruns or whoever the construction manufacturer is for those components they can take the cost overrun so it's kind of like putting the, the parallel that i put it in it's kind of like building a house everybody goes well i want to, I want to go build a new house for you know two hundred thousand dollars well the first thing you do is you start calling up subs looking at land and start putting all the components together and you put it all on a sheet and you add it all up and you go and you see where you're at if it ends up being over your price target, $200,000, you say, well, is it still a good deal or do you find some things to start cutting or calling some other contractors? So we're essentially in that same process, trying to find all this, you know, New Scale's working to find all the manufacturers, design contractors, to really put all the components in place so when we add that up, we stay on target for that $55 a megawatt. I know that's a ton of information. I know I'm way over time. So thank you. Say how long these plants are going to last. What's their lifespan? Years? We expect 60 years. Um, current current plants are designed for. Current plants have a 40-year license. Um, everybody's getting 20-year extensions. Um, we anticipate a 60-year lifespan. So what does that break out to, considering the costs that you're expecting per year? For still at oh per year. Um, so if you divide the total cost for this by 60. With financing costs, it's a, it's a tough number because interest rates and a lot of other things are in there, but you're talking, it's in that couple million, million and a half with, with debt payment per year and energy. So yeah, and, and a lot of that's dependent on where the final numbers come in at. We're, we're hoping, I mean, me personally, I keep pushing fifty-five dollars that not to exceed. I'd like to see it come in in the upper forties. <laughs> hey, I, my job is to protect our electric rates. <laughs> so.